one may be safe in saying that East Anglia is one of the least spoiled parts of our country. Perhaps this is due in no small measure to the fertile nature of its land, thereby offering every inducement to the countrymen to carry on those occupations which for generations have employed father and son. It was for this reason that those early sea rovers, the Angles, left their native shores and made their homes in this part of England. And although their civilization has passed away, their tribe aim still remains. Those who explore its countryside will find many beautiful scenes enlivened by agricultural activity. And during the harvest season, one can secure ample proof of the rich crops the land yields as a reward of careful husbandry. The beauty of this countryside has been many times portrayed, but it was a native of East Anglia, John Constable, the son of a Suffolk miller who captured its real charm. His father's mill at Flatford was the subject of one of his most famous paintings, and the farm life of the beautiful Star Valley offered additional subjects for his canvas. The mill, and also the picturesque Willie Lott's cottage, which is nearby, are faithfully preserved and have become a haven for artists who wish to study in the footsteps of a man who at an early age became a member of the Royal Academy. Once the little town of Woodbridge was of maritime importance and this curious weighing machine adjoining an ancient tavern must have been the only means of settling disputes over the weights of cargoes and the subsequent dues to be paid. This old mill, we believe, is the only one in England worked by the action of the tide. It is over 400 years old, and while still grinding corn, provides a primitive shower for the youth of the town. When the Flemish weavers settled in Suffolk and Norfolk, they brought a new prosperity to the sleepy agricultural villages and towns. In Lavenham and nearby Kersey, the wealthy wool merchants and weavers built beautiful timbered houses which still remain a delight to the eye. When viewed from the top of the street, one sees a perfect glimpse of Tudor England. Carved in the timbers of the Guild Hall is the effigy of its founder, John de Vere, 13th Earl of Oxford, who was first master of the Guild of Corpus Christi, and it was from here that the welfare of the local weavers was guided. At the height of their prosperity, the weavers of Kersey built this imposing church. Although the industry which they introduced no longer flourishes, the aspect and life of this little village seems hardly to have changed during the last 400 years. Built during the reign of Edward I, Framlingham Castle remains a striking example of a fortification erected during a turbulent period of English history and afterwards becoming a palace of the greatest family in East Anglia, the Howards of Norfolk. It was here that Queen Mary sought refuge when an attempt was made to place Lady Jane Grey on the throne of England. The exterior of the castle is carefully preserved, but the interior buildings were pulled down by Sir Robert Hatcham and rebuilt as almshouses in the town. In the butter market, Ipswich, can be seen the most perfect example of a Tudor merchant's house. Hidden in the roof is a chapel in which Charles II is supposed to have taken refuge. The targeting on the exterior reveals a wealth of quaint detail. Plasterwork of this nature was frequently used for the ornamentation of Tudor houses in this part of the country. Situated on the drier side of England, Lowestoft is a healthy resort. It has pleasant sands and promenades, but its real interest is in the fish market, where the early riser can select his or her breakfast. The lowest of trawlers travel as far north as Iceland, but find on the whole the North Sea fishing grounds a profitable venture, especially during the herring season. During the night and early morning, the trawlers arrive at the harbour when the catch is unloaded. The fish soon graded and gutted. Salesmen dispose of each catch by auction to the assembled buyers, after which it's sent by rail to London and to the Midlands. Farther up the coast is Yarmouth, another favourite holiday resort. Behind the wide sands are tastefully laid out gardens with bowling greens and tennis courts. On the pleasure beach one can travel on a splendid scenic railway through a miniature fairyland. A short distance inland is Norwich, 
the county town of Norfolk, and from the top of Muzzled Heath, one can obtain an unrivaled view over the whole town. The Normans founded the magnificent cathedral, whose spire is over 300 feet high. Nearby is the picturesque water gate called Pool's Ferry, and from Cow Tower, the Priory authorities collected their dues from the river craft. A market was established by the Normans in opposition to the more ancient one belonging to the English. Scenes in these country markets are always full of animation, and from the stalls one can purchase anything from a patent corn cure to a suit of clothing. In the olden times, the authorities used to group the various trades into certain streets of the town and it was near Elm Hill that we found the last of the weavers. Here is Mr. Taylor working the bobbin winder or trundle, which in the prosperous days of the industry was a familiar sight in the weavers' cottages. The designs for the cloth are painted on squared paper, and according to the order in which the colors are set in the squares, a hole is made on the card, which allows the color to appear as plotted on the design. The cards are then joined together in a continuous band, and this design requires 1,600 cars to reproduce it on seven inches of cloth. The jacquard loom is operated by manpower. The feet work the engine, which selects the cards where the warp and colors appear, whilst the arms work the shuttles and the beater. In the hand is a stick which throws the shuttles from side to side, and 250 throws have to be made to make one square inch of cloth. The ancient weavers were so frugal that tombstones from the neighboring churchyards served as gibbet weights for applying tension to the warp. In spite of its crazy appearance, this loom still makes fine cloth. Built on the slopes of a slight hill overlooking a mere is the quaint market town of Dis, and a delightful spot for a small township would be hard to find. Caister Castle once commanded the broad marshy estuary of the Bure. It was built by Sir John Fastolf, who served under Henry V and became the governor of the Bastille in Paris. The full staff of Shakespeare is no doubt a corruption of this good knight's name. Few places in Norfolk are as attractive as the Broad, for on a fine summer's day all types of craft may be seen exploring the 200 miles of navigable waterways in the district. There are over 50 Broads, many of which are interconnected by the rivers Yare, Waveney and Bure. There's no need to rough it during a Broadland holiday, for there's a fine fleet of craft from which the budding navigator can make his choice. Adjacent to the rivers and broads are quaint villages, castles and churches, ready to be explored by those who wish for a stretch on shore. Apart from a holiday resort, the broads seem of no great value, but they provide the reeds which the Norfolk Thatcher uses. Thatching is one of those quaint country industries, which is an art in itself, and for generations father and son carry on the same trade. One would think that thatching is one of those slow, dying country crafts, but so many people have been attracted by the appearance of a thatched roof that the Thatcher is in constant demand all over the country. During the autumn and winter months, the reeds are cut from the banks of the broads and allowed to dry. Here is the principle of thatching. By striking the bundle of reeds with a wooden plate studded with horseshoe nails, the reeds are evenly spread out, forming an angle of roughly 45 degrees, which will correspond to the slope of the roof. Those who explore broadland will occasionally see a thatched church, the roofing of which blends in pleasant harmony with a flint exterior. Once King's Lynn was one of the greatest ports in England, and through the South Gate, wagons passed carrying goods to the Midlands from overseas. The corporation plate, which is kept in the Guild Hall, is of great beauty. In the narrow streets one sees the old merchants' houses with their picturesque courtyards. Ships of considerable burden still ascend the tidal estuary to the town, 
where the 17th century custom house overlooks the riverside walls. Bury St Edmunds is the burial place of martyred English King Edmund. He was killed in the nearby village by the Danes, who, when converted to Christianity, helped to build the magnificent abbey. The abbey had a chequered career, for once the townspeople destroyed the main gate and rebuilt it some 20 years later. At the back of an old inn at Brandon, there still carried on an industry more ancient than that of the potter, for it was on the heathland near Brandon where prehistoric man found the flints from which he napped spear and arrowheads. Here is a flint napper at work. First the masses of flints are broken up by a few strokes and the pitted lumps rejected. As many country churches are faced with flint, the nappers are kept constantly at work. It seems incredible that by a few deft strokes, brittle flint can be accurately napped to a given pattern. The finishing off of the edges is most interesting, as the rapid tapping along the sides produces a clear-cut finish. In the days of the flintlock muskets, Brandon had the monopoly of the flint trade, and during the Napoleonic Wars, Brandon flints were used by both the English and the French. From clear pieces of flint, strips are chipped off, which are then trimmed to the exact size used in the gun. In the days of the modern rifle, we wondered who still used flintlock guns. Yet Brandon has the monopoly of this export business to Africa, and awaits the day for Chicago to get sold on the flintlock idea. Situated behind huge earthworks is the Keeper Castle Rising, and it was behind the grim walls that Queen Isabella retired after the murder of her husband, Edward II. The castle was built by the Normans, who are said to have improved on an earlier fortification. Before the days of parliamentary reform, this isolated borough used to return two members of parliament. The Norman church in the village is also of interest, but no one who visits Castle Rising should miss the sight of the pensioners of the Bede House as they leave church on a Sunday morning. During the 17th century, Henry Howard, Earl of Northampton, founded and endowed this charity for the poor female residents of the district, who wear a dress not unlike that of the Welsh national costume. The Bede House is built in the Jacobean style, and the pensioners' quarters surround a pleasant courtyard. Their welfare is guided by a governess who wears a picturesque velvet hat and all wear a small badge bearing the crest of the founder who was related to the Howards of Norfolk. Cambridge has been described as a harmony of grey and green for when viewed from the backs the mellowed stone of the college walls blends in perfect harmony with the green lawns which stretch down to the banks of the camp. During the civil wars Oxford supported the cause of the King, while Cambridge that of Parliament. But even this did not save the buildings the unwelcome attentions of a certain Mr. Dowsing, who was commissioned by the Puritans to examine the college chapels and destroy any Papist ornamentations. Generously endowed by their founders, the colleges of Cambridge can look with pride on such students as John Milton, Samuel Pepys and Sir Isaac Newton who, passing from this haven of learning, left their mark in the world beyond. Once the sleepy village of Walsingham rivaled Canterbury as a mecca for pilgrims, for in the grounds of an Augustinian priory was the shrine of Our Lady of Walsingham. Five English kings and Bruce of Scotland came to visit the shrine and holy well. Henry VIII is said to have walked the last two miles of the journey. He must have cast envious eyes on this shrine, enriched by the gifts of countless pilgrims. When he ordered the dissolution of the monasteries, the great wealth of Walsingham went to swell the royal coffers. An old traveller said that in Cambridge one saw the glory of East Anglia, but in Ely one found the romance. Once an island surrounded by marshland, it was the stronghold of Hereward the Wake, last of the Saxons to resist the Normans. The tale of the monk who guided the Normans across the marshes is well known, but perhaps he made a bargain with the invaders in return for his services that they should build this magnificent cathedral, which has stood for nearly 800 years and witnesses the transformation of a marshy land 
into fertile land which today is still known as East Anglia. Thank you.